Please go to elithecomputerguy.com in order to view schematics, code, and more for the projects that you are learning about. Welcome back. So today I want to talk about data center co-location for your cloud infrastructure. So we've talked about software as a service and infrastructure as a service and platform as a service and metal as a service and all of these ways that you can offload the types of technology work that are not important for your company, right? So again, if you're out there and you're a construction company, you're trying to sell construction projects, you don't want to worry about servers and data centers and dealing with operating systems and all that kind of thing. You just want software as a service. You just simply want salesforce.com or quickbooks.com or something like that. You want to be able to use uh, functionality and features from software, but you don't want to worry about the infrastructure and servers that go along with it. Uh, now, if you're with a coding or development company, you may want some place to be able to host your code. So you'll go and you will write all of your code. You want some place to put that code where it will run but you don't want to worry about the servers and you don't want to worry about the routing and you don't want to have to worry about all of that kind of stuff. You get all the way to metal as a service and with metal as a service for some reason, maybe you need to get down to those root level permissions in an operating system. So you need to be able to control user accounts and permissions on that operating system. You might even want to be able to go in there and tweak the kernel, but Again, you don't really want to worry about the data center. You don't want to really have to worry about buying physical equipment, all of that kind of thing. So you can go and you can simply rent a dedicated server from one of the service providers. Well, in the same idea, in the same concept, you may be sitting there and going, oh, oh, you know what I want to do? I want to create the next face, or I want to create the next YouTube. And in order to create the next YouTube, I need to use a SAN or a NAS device uh, that's very specific but I don't want to host that in my own facility. I don't want to have to build out a data center. I don't want to have to worry about, you know, HVAC systems and power redundancy and all of that kind of stuff. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy all of this physical equipment. So at this point, I am buying all the physical equipment. I own all of the physical equipment. I'm responsible for the physical equipment, but I'm simply going to go out and rent a place to be able to install this equipment so that people on the internet are able to access it. And that's what we get to with uh, co-location data centers. Essentially, these are data centers where you are able to rent space in the data center and rent functionality from the data center uh, and then put your own equipment in there. So you can go in there, and again, if you go into some of these co-location facilities, you can see some amazingly high-end equipment. You go in there and you're like, wow, I haven't actually seen one of those things in the wild. Uh, and then other, other racks, you can go and you can take a look and go, wow, I didn't know one of these those things is still running. Like it's really interesting to go into a co-location data center because it is. You'll go in there and you'll see a rack of the highest in equipment that, that money can buy. And then another rack right beside it, I swear, You'll see some piece of crap 10-year-old Dell server just chugging along. Uh, and the reason is, is the reason is, is because that crappy ass 10-year-old Dell server is doing whatever the customer needs it to do. Basically, they need a place uh, to be able to, to have it run. They need to be able to connect it to the internet. They need to have power and all those kinds of things. Um, but again, they don't really care the, about the power of the machine. It doesn't have to be the latest. It doesn't have to be the greatest. We just need some place to be able to plug in our machine and make sure that it's running 24 hours a day. So when we're talking about co-location facilities, this is where you own all the equipment. You're responsible for all of the equipment. You are simply a rate renting space in racks or you're renting entire racks on their own and you're getting a connection to the internet uh, at whatever speed you're contracted for. So basically it's kind of like a condo space for servers and for networking equipment. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, co-location and data centers. So the first thing to be thinking about when you're thinking about a data center co-location is basically the physical location of where you would like your servers to run. And there's a couple of things you need to think about when you're thinking about that. So when you're thinking about a data center co-location, the first thing to realize is that there are a 
crap ton of co-location facilities out there in the world. So there are co-location facilities all throughout the United States, throughout Europe, uh, throughout Asia, throughout Africa, the whole nine yards. So when you're thinking about co-location, this is not something where there is only one or two vendors out there uh, with a couple of data centers that you can go with. Uh, there are just, there are an enormous number of vendors out there with an num enormous uh, number of different options for you. So one of the first things that you need to be thinking about is does it matter geographically where your servers are located? So you're going to be thinking about things like latency and that type of thing. So if you're use, doing video game servers, right, latency is very important. So you want your servers to be physically as close to your end user as possible. On the other hand, if you're doing something like an online backup system, you know, <sighs> As long as the system's back up in a reasonable amount of time, it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, so if, if you're doing an online backup system, you might be able to put uh, your servers anywhere in the world uh, that you want uh, based off of things like uh, regulatory compliance and costs and that type of thing. So the first thing that you need to be thinking about is as far as your end users are concerned, does it matter where your servers are physically located? The next thing you need to be thinking about is how are you going to be maintaining maintaining your servers once you spin them up and are they close enough to you uh, to actually be able to maintain your server. So it is very important to understand here. This is not metal as a service, right? So metal as a service is where you rent a dedicated server and if something happens to that dedicated server, then the tech support for the company that you're dealing with uh, has to deal with it. Remember, these are your physical machines. These are your physical machines. If a CPU fail fans on one of your physical machines, you are responsible for it. And so this is something that you really do have to think about, right? So if you go with a data center uh, that's within half an hour of you and, and something crashes, then it's rather easy for you to be able to get in your car and go and try to try to fix whatever's going on. On the other hand, again, uh, if you pick a data center that's closer to your end users, but maybe far away from you, then that means you have to travel uh, to wherever that data center is to repair the equipment, or you have to have some kind of maintenance contract with some kind of, let's say, IT uh, consultancy or managed service provider uh, to go and repair that equipment. So that is something that is very important to be thinking about is when you think about spinning up your equipment somewhere, if something fails, if that stupid ass CPU fail, uh, fan fails, how are you going to get your systems back online? And again, if your equipment you know, is halfway around the country or halfway around the world, and you literally have to hop on a plane in order to repair that equipment, that can run in, you into a lot of problems. So that's something to be thinking about. Uh, then past that, when you're going out and you're thinking about renting in a co-location facility, uh, you're going to be renting by what is called the U. Uh, so U, U is a standard unit of measurement. Uh, as far as rack servers are concerned. So whenever you're dealing with rack mounted equipment, whether it's rack mounted servers, whether it's rack mounted switches or other networking equipment, there will be a size of that equipment in U. Uh, so normal size servers, you'll hear of one U servers or one U uh, size networking equipment or whatever. And so that is a unit of measurement. Uh, larger servers, such as, uh, let's say, servers that hold a lot of hard drives, let's say storage servers, those might be for you pieces of equipment. So when you're going to go out and rent space in a co-location facility, you need to think about how many you you need uh, to be thinking about uh, how much space you need. So basically, a lot of times you'll actually go out, and for me, I actually had my servers in a co-location facility for a while when I started the business, and so it was $100 per month month per U. So I went in with two one U servers. So that means I had to use two U's of space. And so that cost me $200 a month. And so when you go out to rent space, you can either rent by the U, sometimes you can rent by the quarter rack, sometimes you can rent by the half rack, and sometimes you can rent by the full rack. But something to be thinking about is if you rent, rent by the full rack or the quarter rack or the half rack, is just making sure you know how many U are in that rack. So, uh, so when you have a server rack, different server racks have different sizes. So uh, the standard size is like a 42 U server rack. So theoretically, you could put in 42 one-year U servers, theoretically. 
Um, but one of the things you have to be thinking about with whatever co-location facility you go with, uh, the rack sizes may be different. It might be a 50U rack, or maybe it's a 35U or 36U rack, I suppose. Uh, and so when you go out to rent a full rack, you do need to, uh, to remember how much space is in that actual rack, and then be thinking about how much space you need for your equipment. So the first thing you need to be thinking about is how many U do you need. Past that is then power consumption. So power consumption is one of those things. A lot of us don't really think about when we're spinning up servers, right? You plug your server, you plug your computer into the wall, you turn it on, right? As long as it turns on, you have enough power. You don't really think about it much more than that, right? Uh, well, one of the things to be thinking about when you go into a co-location facility is that they, uh, part of the contract is they will give you uh, so many amps. So one amp, five amp, 10 amp, 30 amp. So when you put a piece of equipment into the rack, that will have a certain amount of power draw. It might be half an amp, it might be five amps, right? Depending on the piece of equipment. So if you have something like a switch or a router or rather just a normal crappy server or something like that, you might have like a one amp power draw. On the other hand, if you have some big piece of storage equipment that has a lot of hard drives spinning and doing whatever it is that they do, you may have a lot larger power draw. You may have up to something like a four amp power draw. So one of the things that you need to be thinking about is what is the power consumption of the equipment that you're going to be putting into the co-location facility, and then how much power are you actually buying, right? If you buy one amp of power, and then your equipment requires 10 amps of power, it's basic math, your equipment isn't going to work. Uh, and so this can be a frustrating thing, especially for new folks. Uh, now, when you're trying to figure out the actual power draw of equipment, uh, it can be a little bit confusing, because again, when you have equipment, um, depending on what load they're under, depending on what additional things you've added to that equipment. Do you have GPU cards in your equipment? How many hard drives do you have spinning in your equipment? Do you have platter-based hard drives or do you have solid state drives? You can have um, a lot of different um, results for what the power draw may be. I would argue uh, you can get um, a little device that'll actually show you how much amps how many amps your equipment is pulling. I, I would say that you should probably purchase one of those devices, plug your equipment into that device to make sure what the power draw is. Uh, if, if you don't have that or if you don't have the equipment yet, uh, then you can call up the vendors, you can communicate with the vendors and try to see what the expected amp usage will be. And so this is an important thing to be thinking about uh, when you're gonna be actually going out there and renting from a co-location facility. Uh, past that, you then have the bandwidth that you are allocated. So whenever you're dealing with bandwidth, uh, first you're going to get the speed. So what is, what is the total amount of concurrent speed that you can use? Is it 100 megabits per second? Is it a gig per second? Is it 10 gigs per second? Is it literally almost unlimited? You might go with a data center that gives you almost unlimited. But one of the important things to be thinking about is what speed are you going to be getting out of your co-location facility? So if you're doing basic things such as you're doing an email server, Oh, I don't know, things like email servers, that type of thing, uh, maybe 100 megabit per second connection is more than enough for you. Now, on the other hand, if you're doing some kind of like video streaming service, then you may want a gigabit per second or all the way up to 10 gigabit per second um, connections. This is something to think about. And one thing to be thinking about is you can have load balancing within your equipment within your rack. So let's say you rent a whole rack you have a 10 gigabit per second connection coming in. And then what you can do is you might have, let's say four different uh, video streaming servers, and then you can have load balancing as users are coming in to view content. Uh, they can be load balanced across those multiple servers. And so each one of those servers, who knows, each server may max at a one gigabit per second connection. So let's say the servers have one gig cards in them. So you have four servers with one gig cards you have a total 10 gig pipe coming in, and then what can happen is you can have a physical load balancer then then load balances to those different servers, again, to distribute the load. So one of the things you need to be thinking about is what is the total bandwidth that you are going to be getting out of your co-location facility. Again, that can, that can run you into problems. And one of the things to be thinking about too is not only 
how much bandwidth you're currently using, uh, but can you scale up into the future? So with some co-location facilities, they'll give you 100 megabits per second. And if you want 10 gigabits per second, you, you simply have to pay for it. You just, it's, a, it's a credit card migration. You know, you swipe your credit card, now you got 10 gigabits per second. Uh, one thing you have to be careful about though, is some co-location facilities, facilities uh, you get 100 megabit per second connection, and that's all you will ever get. And so at that point, it is no longer a credit card migration. It is literally, if you need more bandwidth, you need to move all of your equipment to an entirely, entirely different co-location facility. So with co-location facilities, just like a lot of other things I tell you about when you're purchasing equipment, think about what uh, the upgrade or the scaling strategy is gonna be, right? It's like, okay, I need 100 megabits per second now. How much would a gigabit per second cost me? and then see if that's reasonable. Again, you, you gotta look at costs, right? Even if they offer a gigabit per second, maybe it's a stupid cost. But then you say, okay, is 10 gigabits uh, available? Is, is, uh, is more than that available? Basically, you see what's available, what their plans are to increase things like bandwidth, and see if that seems reasonable for you. Because the last thing that you wanna do is the last thing is you, know, you spin up an entire rack of equipment, you configure everything, and then if you outgrow your co-location, facility and that could be a really a big problem uh, past the general speed you then come into the question of usage so depending on what co-location facility you go with this is all whatever is in the contract. Uh, some co-location facilities allow you to basically have unlimited usage. So you get that speed and you more or less get unlimited usage. Uh, other co-location facilities, they will meter you um, and they will tell you, you know, this is how much it costs per terabyte of, of bandwidth that you use. And then you sit there and you look at that price and you see if it's reasonable. So that is something to be thinking about. Even with data centers, usage costs may apply. Uh, past that, uh, you there's then the question of IP addresses. So how many IP addresses are they going to offer you? So with whatever co-location facility you go with and whatever plan you go with, they may give you one IP address or they may give you up to 30 or more, or you may be, may be able to buy numerous IP addresses. So basically they can offer you internet accessible IP addresses, internet facing IP addresses. And so something to think about is, okay, do you want your equipment behind some kind of NAT firewall? So in network address translation, you have one IP address that hits that firewall router. And then behind that is your own IP address scheme. And then you route traffic however you want to route traffic. Or do you want all of your servers uh, to be uh, internet facing and so people can connect to them from the outside world and so that's something to think about is how many IP addresses are you going to get and then again like with things like the servers then you have to think about again how many network cards are going to be in each server how many internet facing you know network cards are you going to have think about all the ports that you're going to use and then figure out is that going to be good for you Past that, when you're talking about bandwidth too, is the question is going to be things like routing protocols. Uh, so again, you are now in a data center. So you're now in a data center. You're playing with the big boys, the big dogs, whether or not, whether or not you fully appreciate that. And so one of the things to be asking is, can you use routing protocols such as BGP? Uh, so border gateway protocol is the major protocol for um, basically internet Oh, facing equipment. So a lot of times most people don't actually use with deal with the BGP protocol. But again, if you have a whole rack of equipment, if you have a whole rack of equipment, you may have, you know, a chunk of that being your Cisco networking gear or some other enterprise class networking gear. And you can actually use BGP with some of these co-location facilities. So that's one of the things uh, to be thinking about too, is basically what, what protocols do you need? Do you need BGP or do you just basically need a, a, an IP address and you don't really care about anything past that? Uh, from that, you go into security. So one of the things to be thinking about with these data centers is security is still very important. So when you're thinking about security in a data center, do you realize if you do something such as renting one or two U's of space in a rack, well, that means you're going to have a lot of other people in that rack with you again. So when I was renting a uh, use at a co-location facility uh, close to me, uh, basically, you know, I was renting two U's out of a 42 U rack. And so there were another 20 or 30 customers using the exact same rack uh, that I was in. Well, <laughs> yeah. So just imagine you have a rack where 20 other people have access 
to the rack that your equipment is in. So it means all of your cables, everything that you've set up, some stupid little you know, junior level level technician comes in, unplugs the wrong thing, and all of a sudden your infrastructure <laughs> goes offline. Um, and this is something that you do need to be thinking about as far as security and all that is concerned, is if you have 20 other companies in the, the rack uh, with you that you're renting space out of, just realize that when their technicians come in, when they're unplugging equipment, they could unplug your equipment. If they, if they hired a hacker who decides to start plugging in USB sticks into the, the random servers in that rack, uh, you actually really do have a massive physical security vulnerability. So that's something to be thinking about. That's one reason why people will decide to rent either half racks or full racks for themselves. So if you rent a half rack or a full rack, they, they will have doors and generally they will actually have keys that you can lock. So when you, when you rent your own rack, or half rack that is all you it has a door on it and it actually it has a key on that door so it can be locked up so nobody else can get and actually deal with your servers and so this might be an important thing uh, depending on what you're doing again just imagine 20 other companies 20 other people hiring complete morons that those morons are going to come in and whenever they're doing their maintenance for their people's equipment again at any point they could pop out a little usb stick shove it into some some random server and again it would be very hard to even detect that that's happened so that's one thing to be thinking about securities do you want a basic door and then beyond that if you're really dealing with compliance issues you can actually go to these data centers and for the right amount of money for the right amount of money uh they will literally fence off areas of the data center for you so let's say you're gonna you're going to rent five racks per month so you're gonna have five racks full of equipment you want to make sure it's there's physical security around those pieces of equipment. They will actually build a full, uh, it's just a chain link fence, like one of those crappy chain link fences. That's what they do. It's a crappy chain link fence. And then you have a lock, whatever kind of lock you want on there. And then that adds an additional level of physical security for you. Um, when you're thinking about you know, what kind of security you need for your data center equipment. Past that, one of the things you need to be thinking about is how you're gonna be interacting with your equipment if there is a problem, if there's a meltdown, right? We all hope that servers do not crash for random ass reasons, but of course they do crash for random ass reasons. And if your server crashes, um, you know, whether you can get to SSH or remote desktop protocol or any of your remote management tools, that is a big question. Uh, so one of the things that many of these data centers offer is they actually offer what's called IP KVM services. So uh, KVM is keyboard video mouse. And so what they can, they can offer you is they can actually have their technicians go to your equipment, actually plug in these little K, uh, IP KVM uh, devices, and then you're able to remotely manage your equipment from wherever the, in the world you are all the way down to the post level so you know you reboot the server and then it comes up with the the, the boot sequence and all of that kind of thing if you use something like ip kvm you're able to then access all of those low level configurations and may, might be able to restore your equipment that way uh, so that's something to think about and then the final thing to be thinking about when you're thinking about going to a co-location data center is how long will it take them to provision your space and your bandwidth so the provisioning process is the actual delivery process right so you walk in you see the co-location facility you see all the stuff and you're like great i want this and they say no problem it'll take eight weeks <laughs> And that's something to think about. Again, like how long do you have uh, before you need your equipment spun up? Uh, does it need to be spun up in a couple of days? Uh, is six weeks good for you? This is this is something that you need to consider depending on what data center you're going into, depending on what their compliance issues and all that kind of thing is. Uh, literally going into a data center, uh, some data centers you can go into the next day, other data centers you are literally going to be waiting weeks until you can go into them. And especially if you need to have fences built within the data center or any of other kind of specialized stuff for you uh, that can take a longer time so these are some of the things that you need to be thinking about if you're thinking about going into a co-location facility and just again to have in mind things like how much space do you need how much power you're going to need what do you really think your bandwidth requirements are going to be you know routing requirements is it going to grow with you these are some of the considerations you really have to think about before you sign a contract 
So with all of that, let's go over to the computer so I can show you some of the options that are available when you're thinking about co-location facilities. Now, to be clear, I just kind of picked these options all willy-nilly. I am not recommending anybody here. I just picked these options because they give you an overview of the different things that you should be looking at when you're looking at a co-location facility. So by all means, go with these people or don't go with these people. I am not recommending one way or the other, just to be clear here. So with that, let's go over to the computer and I can show you kind of some more of this, these things that you need to be thinking about when you're gonna be renting in a co-location facility. So this is the type of equipment that you might use in a co-location facility. Uh, so Synology uh, creates a lot of uh, very high quality uh, network attached storage devices. Uh, so this might be a good option for you if you're trying to create the next YouTube or basically you're trying to create some kind of infrastructure that needs a lot of storage. Uh, and so one of the things they have like this rack station RS1619XS Plus. 1U rack mount flagship aimed for file collaboration and high for, uh, performance computation. So obviously this is not a quote unquote Linux machine. This is not a quote unquote Windows machine. You simply buy a Synology, you put your hard drives in there, you do all the configurations, and then you deploy it into the real world. Uh, so if we go here, some of the things that we need to take a look at, um, again, as far as things like CPU and all of that, we don't really care about that for a co-location facility. Uh, the main things that we're looking at is things like the power consumption and the use. Uh, so we keep scrolling down, we go past the file sir, uh, file systems, all that kind of stuff. So what we're going to be looking at here is the appearance. And so we're going to look at the form factor, the RU. And so we can see this particular piece of equipment takes one U of space. So that's going to be the important thing. Again, you're going to need to rent as many U's as is required. So this one needs one U. It tells you some stuff about the weight. It also talks about the rack installation. So if you're gonna need something like a rail kit, so this is something important to be thinking about is um, whenever you're going to have um, networking equipment that's going to go into a rack, then you're most likely going to need something like a rail kit to be able to install it into the rack. So when you buy that one U server, all you get is the one U server, and then you basically you screw the rail kit to the side of the one U server, and that allows you to put it into the rack itself. So this is one of those things to be thinking about. It actually shows you all that stuff. Uh, so you've got all that kind of thing there, and then it does go and it does talk about power. Um, I'm not going to discuss how you figure out the amps in this particular video, uh, because it can actually get pretty squirrely in the real world. Like figuring out what the actual amp usage will be depends on a lot of, on a lot of things and so I don't want to muck it up here uh, but basically we can see this has a power supply of 150 watts uh, it has a 100 volt to 200 volt AC um, and then it talks about the power consumption here and then this is the actual power consumption of the device itself uh, so theoretically 68.68 .68 watts uh, when it's being accessed and 34.78 watts when it's in hibernation so just realize here you take this information you take this information and that's supposed to give you how many amps you're going to use but again in the real world that can get a little squirrely uh, if we go over and we take a look at another piece of equipment so again this is the rack station rs uh, 4017xs plus blah 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 we can go and we can take a look at the specs and then again like i say we can scroll down here we can take a look at the appearance so form factor, so this is a 3U device. And so that's gonna be something that you're gonna need to be thinking about. So if you're using a storage device, you have to think about how many hard drives it can, it can store, you have to think about power consumption, you have to think about use, how many U's, so on and so forth. So past that, uh, we can go and we can actually look at some of these co-location facilities. So this is a uh, Voxility. Again, I just randomly found this. Uh, and you can come here and you can take a look at their different co-location uh, co facilities. And again, you may have co-location facilities in places you weren't thinking about. So Los Angeles and Ashburn, Miami, that sounds pretty normal. London sounds normal. Amsterdam may sound normal. But they have things like Bucharest. I'm like, oh, 
that, that's a place you can go to, right? Vienna, Frankfurt. Uh, so it is important to be thinking about is different companies offer these data centers in different locations. Uh, then past that, you're gonna select um, how many U you're gonna need. So are you, do you need 10 U? So this particular company uh, will rent 10 U in a full rack, 20 U in a full rack, or a full rack cabinet. So we'll simply select that. And then over here, you can go for your commitment, right? So a one year commitment, uh, price per month, two year commitment, or three year commitment. So just like any other contract thing you have to think about is how long do you want to be locked into this contract? Um, the longer you're locked into the contract, the better the price will be. Um, Right, so on and so forth. Uh, so we can go here and then let's say we can click on uh, Ashburn uh, Reston. And with that, that shows us uh, the two facilities in Ashburn and Reston. So this is Virginia, so this would be relatively close to me. If I click on Miami, it shows me the options in Miami. Amsterdam shows me options there. Bucharest shows me the options there. And again, this is something to be really thinking about, things like price. So if you're in Ashburn or Reston, uh, one of their data centers will cost you $2,200 a month. Uh, a different data center will cost you $1,500 a month. If you go to Bucharest, uh, you can get uh, the data center, uh, a full rack down to $717 per month. Because do remember for these data centers, they are doing things like paying for rent. So if if they're in a more expensive area, rent and all that kind of thing is going to cost them more money. Power is going to cost them money, right? So something to think about is you might want to put your equipment in a uh, less expensive area uh, if it doesn't really matter to you. Or realize uh, you don't want to be too cheap. So let's say if you're in if you're in DC, the DC area and you think, oh, I'll just put my equipment in Bucharest because it's less expensive there. Uh, do remember, if your CPU fan fails, <laughs> that means you've got to fly to Bucharest. So anyway, let's just take a look at Ashburn. Uh, we'll go we'll take a look at the expensive one here. Oh, one thing here is, again, delivery, how long it takes to actually uh, provision the space for you. Uh, so here, it's five to six weeks. So if you're going to try to go into the Ashburn location, it's five to six weeks. If you're going to try to go into the rest in Virginia, it's three to four weeks. Uh, if we go over to Bucharest again, uh, you know, one of theirs, the Bucharest one is seven days or less. Uh, the other Bucharest one is two months. So again, you can see even with this single company in a single area, you can see there is a, a, a large difference in how long it will take to actually provision the space that you're going to be renting. Uh, so we're going to go here and then we're going to click on the details. Uh, so we click on the details and it's then going to give us a bunch of information here and we can start taking a look at this. It says the data center, it says the location, where it is on the map, uh, space, full depth, 19-inch uh, cabinet, um, minimum uh, 42U. So you're going to get at least 42U, so that's important for you. Uh, guarantees, 99.9999% power using both lines. Who's here? Shows you some different things. Uh, then let's see here, power circuits. So this is an important thing to be looking at. So you've got two lines, uh, a, pri a primary plus B redundant at 30 amps each. So you get a lot of amps here. Um, so that's a thing, uh, 120 volts, if that matters to you. Uh, we can go down, we can take a look at a lot of the different information here, their, their service level agreement, uh, different things with network access, you know, what your speed is. So it's connected, so as an internet provider, so it has a direct access to premium networks, 10 gigabits per second download and gaming, theoretically. Uh, but the connection speed is actually one gigabit per second. So it's connected It's connected to equipment that can theoretically give you 10 gigabits per second, but you've actually got a one gigabit per second connection speed. Uh, and then here, uh, bandwidth packages. So how much it costs for bandwidth. For here, you're gonna be paying per terabyte. And here, it's not actually that bad. So $5.50 uh, uh, per terabyte. All traffic though, incoming and outgoing. Uh, so you need to think about that. Uh, we go down uh, VLAN routing, uh, IP addresses. Uh, so basically uh, how it's gonna deal with IP addresses for you and different things. You can also get den uh, denial of service protection, some other things here. So this is one of the providers you can go with. Again, a little bit, bit expensive, uh, but you can get two power lines at 30 amp each. You can get a 42U rack and you get a lot of these other things. Uh, if we go over, we can take a look at a different company. So this is Colocation America, right? So if you're like, well, wow, Eli, 
You know, I was interested. I was interested in this until I saw it was going to cost me $1,400. Well, again, remember, co-location facility is like everything. There's all kinds of different options out there. Uh, so with co-location America, uh, you can rent one U of space, two U's of space, a quarter rack, which is 10 U's of space, half a rack, which is 21 U's of space, or a full rack, uh, which is 42 U's of space. So here, you might get into a price point that you like better. But as with all things, a different price point gives you different things. So for one U of space, it'll only cost you $75 a month. So you can put that one U Synology storage device in there, a one year U Xeon servers, so on and so forth. For that, you get 10 terabytes of bandwidth. Uh, and then as far as power is concerned, you get two amps of power. Now to be clear, two amps of power should be fine, but again, depending on your equipment, maybe not, who knows. Uh, and then IPv4, uh, you get one usable IP address, give you some more of this, you know, gig E port uplink, some other things. Uh, $99 a month, you get two U's of space, for only a little bit more, you get two U's. You get the same amps, uh, you still get one usable IP address, so that might run into uh, problems to you. So again, that's one thing you have to be thinking about, like, Again, so a 2U piece of equipment could go in there, and then you only need one IP address for a 2U piece of equipment. But if you have two uh, pieces of equipment that are 1U each, then only having one IP address might run you into some problems. So something to think about. Uh, you go up to the quarter rack, 399, uh, 25 megabit per second dedicated. So there it looks like the bandwidth, you don't have a cap on bandwidth, but you only get 25 megabits per second. So again, depending on what you're doing, an email server, that might be fine. A real-time communication servers, that might suck. You Now you get five amps of power, and then you get five uh, usable IP addresses. You go up to a quarter rack, you get 50 megabits per second dedicated, uh, 20 amps. So now you're actually getting some, some decent power. And then you get uh, 13 reusable IP addresses. And then you go up to a full rack, uh, nine. $199. Again, you're at 20 amps and then you get 29 IP addresses. And so this is one of those things that you should be thinking about and realizing, you know, there's different, there's different benefits and different costs for whatever it is that you're looking for. Uh, if we go past that, one of the things to be thinking about again is the security of your equipment. Uh, so with this particular company, uh, Equinix, Equinix, uh, just to show you, uh, they offer uh, some security for your equipment other companies might not offer. Uh, so they have private cages. So build to order with space assigned based on the power allocation and cabinet quality, uh, quantity, uh, mesh walls, demarcation rack and patch panels, locking door, a ladder rack and fiber raceway up to first cabinet position or up to 10 feet. Security accessories included uh, dedicated cameras and biometric hand scanners, right? So if you go with them, not only are they going to build you the, the, uh, the fence and all that kind of thing, but then you get dedicated cameras and things like biometric hand scanners that might be good if you're dealing with uh, compliance issues. Uh, cabinets, again, uh, steel frames with lockable, fully ventilated doors. So this should be the pretty normal thing. Uh, so that's your base level of security in any kind of these co-location facilities. If you rent a whole rack, uh, it should be lockable. And then here you can actually have suites. <laughs> Again, if you're going to get really fancy. Customized areas fully enclosed by solid partitions. Walls, doors, cable trays for power and cable security and PDUs. Cross connects runs to patch panel and designated cabinets. So again, depending on your particular situation, you know, simply having a rack that has a lock on it, that might be fine. Or you might want a cage. So you have a cage and that basically has a fence and that might be fine. Or you might want full physical walls around your equipment. And so again, this is the different type of security options that different companies may or may not provide. Uh, then we can go over to co-location. Uh, this was just a curious one. This one, I don't really know where they're at. I actually pulled them up on the internet and I thought their pricing strategy was kind of curious. Uh, but otherwise, I literally have no idea where these people are at. Like if you click on pricing, you just go down here. And if you click on home, you're here. If you click on contact, again, like that's a question. Like, no, no seriously, seriously, what, what is their address? I literally don't know where these people are. Uh, but anyways, again, you can see here, they, these folks have different options. They have a starter rack, a gig power rack, and a 10G duo rack. 
So wherever they are in the world, right? $295 a month, you get a locking half rack, 10 amp of power, uh, 120 volts AC, 100 megabit uh, per second ethernet up and down, 100 megabit per second uh, BGP4. So these people will uh, give you uh, BGP access. And then they talk about having their megawatt diesel generator backup power. Again, something to be thinking about is, is the backup power if power fails for a facility. And then something to look at here is they have a one-time install fee of $500. So again, it's things to be thinking about with prices is you may be paying per you, you may be paying for bandwidth, you may be paying for IP addresses, what are setup costs? These are all things you should consider. Uh, for $500 a month, you get uh, 20 amps of power, uh, you get a full rack, so this is $500 a month. So this is less, This is half the price of the last place. Uh, you get a gigabit per second Ethernet up and down. Again, you get the, the BGP backbone, uh, and that has a $600 uh, installation fee. And then for $3,000 a month, you get a dual locking full racks. So you would actually get two full racks. You would get 10 gigabits per second of bandwidth. Um, and then you also have an install fee of $3,000. So... You know, depending on where the hell in the world these people are, because <laughs> I honestly don't know. Like, I literally, I have no idea where the hell these people are. Um, but, you know, again, that's the kind of thing uh, that might be valuable for you. So these are some of the options that are available out there. And so kind of the things to be thinking about if you're thinking about going with a co-location facility. So those are some things to be thinking about if you're looking at co-location. Again, the value of a co-location facility is you get to have your own equipment. So you physically own all of your equipment. You can, you can modify it however you like. And basically all you're doing is you're renting space, you're renting bandwidth, and you're renting power uh, from the co-location facility. And so you can have full enterprise class equipment running for your, comp for your company, even if you're literally just working out of the basement. And so again, this is an important thing to think about in the modern world. Like if you have, if you're creating the next Instagram, you're, you're creating the next great startup company, right? You, the, you may be working at out of your basement you may be working out of your garage but you can buy you know enterprise class equipment install it into a co-location facility and as far as your physical then tech infrastructure is concerned you're you can be a world-class operation and this is an important thing to be thinking about this modern world of technology businesses where again you can have a couple of grody geeks working out of their basement but their infrastructure can literally be world class because it doesn't matter where you're doing the physical work anymore um, as long as you have the right type of equipment and it's being serviced in the appropriate way. So this is something to be thinking about. Uh, again, I do like co-location facilities um, for a lot of startup companies because when you start looking at cloud services, it is important to think about the price point for the different things you're going to be buying from cloud services. So to be clear, if you're going to use Azure or AWS or DigitalOcean or anything like that, uh, when when it comes to compute and when it comes to database database services you cannot beat the price of cloud services again pure compute uh, and pure things like database services aws and azure uh, the price point is just amazing right run your web run your websites from AWS and Azure. Run all that kind of you know, database stuff from AWS and Azure. But something to realize is that when you start getting into data intensive uh, tasks, such as data storage or using bandwidth, so if you're gonna create an, a, another YouTube, um, Azure and AWS suck. They suck. The cost, the cost for storage and the cost uh, for bandwidth usage on things like AWS and Azure is brutal it is absolutely brutal so if you try to spin up an alternative to youtube using pure aws or azure infrastructure frankly you're going to go bankrupt i mean you, there's just there's just not enough money out there but something to be thinking about is again you go with Synology or some other kind of san or nas type equipment and for a hundred thousand dollars for for the for the initial outlay it'll be expensive but you can spend a hundred thousand dollars to create a nice storage infrastructure. You then put that into a facility that's gonna cost you a couple thousand dollars a month. And now the upfront outlay will be more expensive, but as you have users start actually using your service, 
over time the, 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 the price or the cost to actually provide services to your end users will be a hell of a lot less expensive if you're using, uh, again, something like a co-location facility and your own equipment. And so this is where you need to be thinking, again, and the, the whole idea of creating cloud-based architectures what you need to really be thinking about is, you know, what are your requirements? You need to be thinking about costs. You need to be thinking about regulations and all that kind of stuff. And then you need to think about, okay, what is the best way to build this infrastructure? So my active directory, so my active directory, my email services, that's all got just going to be on my local LAN, right? Uh, but then uh, for the actual websites, the websites for my company, again, if you're creating an alternative to YouTube, the websites, those are going to be up on cloud services, AWS or Azure, something like that. But then when I do a video embed, that video embed is then going to point back to my servers in my co-location facility. Right. And so that's where you start thinking about the, the, these 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 cloud architectures, about how how do you utilize everything most appropriately for what you're currently doing? So this is why I say the idea, the concept of keeping everything private on your own network now is idiotic. But also the concept of putting everything up in the cloud is also probably pretty idiotic. Right. You know, you look at these things and you think, OK, how how can I leverage all of these different options uh, to give me the best performance and the best price for whatever it is that I'm trying to accomplish? And so that's where some things again, Active Directory, all that kind of stuff. You'll keep that in your local LAN, uh, possibly email services, Salesforce, things like that. Maybe that'll be off off in Office 365. You'll just rent those services. Uh, then again, for your for your website sites and all that you'll build some kind of cloud infrastructure but then you can have that cloud infrastructure and some of that cloud infrastructure then points back to the servers and services that you've created in a co-location facility and that's that's what your architecture starts to look like uh, and that's when you start to can do some really really cool things so as always, I enjoyed doing this video. Uh, and again, if you haven't looked at co-location facilities, definitely take a look at co-location facilities. I'm telling you, I've seen a couple of startup companies. Eh, I've seen a couple of startup companies where I swear, <laughs> I swear, if they had just done the outlay on physical hardware and put their stuff into a co-location facility, I still think they would have been around. Uh, but because they went pure AWS, uh, they went bankrupt because, of course, they did. <laughs> Data storage and bandwidth on AWS is brutally expensive. So anyways, with that, I'll talk, see you folks later.